Coca, su naray, su naray en ti. 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 Hello, hi, welcome to this new episode of the Mango TV podcast. Today we have Jorge Ferrer. Jorge Ferrer, PhD, is a clinical psychologist, author, and educator. He was a professor of psychology for more than 20 years at California Institute of Integral Studies, San Francisco, where he also served as chair of the Department of East-West Psychology. Jorge is the author of dozens of articles and several books on psychology, education, religious studies, and intimate relationship, including Participation and the Mystery, Transpersonal Essay in Psychology, Education, and Religion, and Love and Freedom, Transcending Monogamy and Polyamory. Jorge was a member of the Esalen Institute Center for Theory and Research, where he also taught workshops and embodied spirituality. Jorge received the Fetzner Presidential Award for his seminal work on consciousness studies and was selected as an advisor to the Religions for Peace Organization of the United Nations. Learn more at .jorgeferrer.com. Welcome, Jorge. So Jorge is the, um, a friend of mine and it's a little bit my go-to person for anything academic and I like to call him like a scholar in residence at Mangu TV podcast. Because as some of you might know, Mangusta production started, you know, maybe 20 years ago now with exploring psychedelics and personal transformation with the two documentary Neurons to Nirvana and the 2012 Time for Change, exploring personal transformation and how global transformation come from personal transformation. So that was 20 years ago. And since then, this two topic has evolved in more interest, but all around this idea of personal development, psychology, the integration between mind, body, and psyche, how to live a more harmonious life, how to live in society, how to prepare for a third millennium, for a more beautiful world that our heart knows is possible, as Charles Eisenstein says. So as you heard from her bio, Jorge is the perfect candidate to elaborate on all the topics dear to Mango TV. But first, let me ask you a very personal question. So who is Jorge Ferrer today? What turns you on? What upsets you? What are your beliefs? What, who are you today? Thank you, Giancarlo, for the invitation and for being here with me. And what I would say, like what's unfolding in my life in the last few years, is a, is a big shift in the sense that for many years I was in academia. And my intention these days is to reach more people when you write academic books. You just reach academics, librarians, and a few students. But most people in the world, you know, don't read academic books. So in my last books, I've been trying to be more, more personal, more down to earth, especially also writing about topics such as intimate relationships relationships and, and so forth. So that's one shift. And the other shift also that is happening is like, you know, I've been working more also from, from the bottom up, so to speak, in terms of catalyzing transformation through workshops, through teachings, through podcasts. But also there is like a big shift to also start trying to work, having an impact in like a higher levels of influence and power. So I've been associated recently with the Mobius executive leadership that works with governments and corporations who are also trying to affect change at that level top down amazing but so you know forgive me for asking you something a little bit like basic because you know my goal with the podcast is to try to you know simplify and popularize you know difficult concepts so especially here in ibiza there's a lot of talk about you know psychedelic assisted psychotherapy other type of other type of psychedelic transpersonal transpersonal psychology personal development, life coaching. Can you try to put a little bit of order in all these terms, even from, you know, from an historical point of view, to give us a little bit of a history of, you know, how, when psychology started, how is it changing due to recent scientific discovery, like with the fMRI machine, the full moon network, how is transpersonal psychology been, how was it born, how was pretty much ignored, how might have a comeback 
as as a put your professor hat on now <laughs> for 10 minutes to clarify all these terms. Sure. Well, transpersonal psychology was born in the late 60s, in 1968. And the transpersonal psychology was born of the influence of three different currents. On the one hand, was like some currents in Western psychology, especially depth psychology, Jungian and humanistic psychology, and the human potential movement that had started before in Esalen Institute and other areas. That's one. And then the other was like the coming into the west of the Eastern gurus, uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and the Beatles, Yogi and Trumpa, especially kind of Advaita, Hindu and Buddhist. But the third one that is very important is connected to your interest is the whole counter countercultural movement and their own psychedelic experimentation. Yeah. So, Sorry yes. to interrupt, Jorge, because, you know, you, you took for granted a lot of things that you know, maybe go back to the three origin of transpersonal, maybe we're just explaining a little bit what does Jungian means, what does, you know, the Eastern guru, where about, mm-hmm. uh, like you were talking with an audience of 10 years old, or okay. maybe 14. <laughs> okay, Jungian psychology is, was born from the depth psychological tradition. Jung was a disciple of Freud, but he expanded the understanding of like the psyche into the more collective unconscious. So that's in itself like a transpersonal movement going beyond individual psychology to a more collective psychology and how that collective psychology and what he called the archetypes influence personal psychology. So that was one of his key insights. <clears throat> and then, the, you know, in the 60s, you know, we, we witnessed like this proliferation of like many Eastern gurus, like teachers from India, India, teachers, Tibetan lamas, and uh, coming into the West and, and becoming really popular also with the counterculture. Something very key here is that many of the hippies, and I see this, you know, in a, in a positive way, <laughs> because this term today is kind of has all connotations, many of the hippies in the 60s that were experimenting with psychedelics, they were already reading Eastern philosophy. And they start making the connections, they start realizing, wow, some of the states of contemplative states that are described in this literature are very similar, if not identical, of things we are experimenting ourselves with LSD, for example. So transpersonal psychology is in a way like, like took all that confluence and kind of systematized that confluence, developing theoretical frameworks to understand all how all that happened in a developmental continuum. Like transpersonal psychology is like what is telling us but online is like, you can grow more than what culture and society have told you. Culture and society tell us, you know, you become like a rational, egoic personality and, and so forth. But transpersonal psychology tells you you're also a spiritual being and, and it's a developmental thing. You can really, if you continue growth, growing, you move towards self-realization. Uh, as our Han Maslow, one of the founders of transpersonal psychology, stated, and self-realization is like what happened or the pool that happened when you have all other basic needs cover, physiological needs, belonging needs, self-esteem. He realized that people move towards self-actualization and also they start having also what he called peak experiences that also he associated with some of those states in the Eastern tradition, like Satori and Sen. In a way, Maslow also was one of the persons who also started making these kind of universalist claims that we're going to, I think, talk later about. I see, I see. My where does this, you know, pressure for this, you know, rational, detached, problem-solving approach to life. It comes from competition and, pro- and private property and, and neoliberal capitalism, or is more rooted in Descartes, in the glorification of mind. How did we get into this very intellectual state? Yes, my sense that there are many different kind of like causes or factors involved in this. But I would say that one of the main ones is like the great success of science. The great access of technological science, a rational science, like in a way it had such a liberating impact in the modern Western world that was kind of like constrained by these very dogmatic uh, religious approaches that, that prevented people from, from having developing like free inquiry into the world. And also free art, Michelangelo was kind of censored as well. So in a way like a science kind of like helped so many people over the many centuries like to free themselves from those constraints and that was extremely liberating and that's why like science is very enthroned today you know we go to scientific experts all the time and of course it's a good thing that they are there <laughs> helping us with their expert knowledge but at the same time it's like if you go to if you see kind of any curriculum of any kind of university it's very it's all then all the teachings all the education is very cognizant it's just 
you know, tuned to develop the rational mind of the students and the critical mind of the students. So there is not much education for the heart. There is not much education for different states of consciousness. There is not much education for the body. And that's a problem. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a problem because we start living in our heads. <laughs> we start living in our heads in a, as disembodied human beings. And that is what kind of also capitalists pray from because whenever you are living in your head you disconnect yourself from from just embodiment your sensual embodiment you disconnect, your, disconnect yourself from a sense of being fully alive here and therefore you forget yourself and you need more things and then you go into self-indulgence and not towards nobility yes yes but let's let's stay on this a little bit longer because i can hear a lot of you know secular materialistic you know newtonian cartesian which is pretty much our paradigm today saying you know what is nonsense about this i live in my mind which you know i'm a thinking being and 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 i'm very and i'm very happy and it's very important and you know my body is fine i do sport i go running but so what would you argue to this this objection well uh, my sense is there is something very different from like um you know, like deciding from a mental perspective what's good for my body, what's good for Dan to living yourself as a multidimensional being with your heart, your instincts and your sexuality and your body and your mind are like the same partners co-creating your life. And that's what we have not been able to do because we have not received the education to do so. In a way, if you, if you, if you notice, like a most Western psychotherapy It's not much than emotional education. <laughs> People learn to identify their emotions, to express them, to receive them. So there is that there. And of course, today we all, you already are seeing like, uh, you know, developments towards a moralistic education. Even in children, you know, there is mindfulness, there is emotional intelligence in the schools, there is mindfulness practices uh, starting to become part of education. So I think that even from a more mainstream perspective, people are already recognizing that there is much more than the rational mind and that a fulfilling human life and a caring human life, and that's what this world needs more. <laughs> Care requires more than just being super smart. Yes. And also, the, I feel that the problem with the mind and the intellect is that it gets conditioned and shaped by your environment, your biography, and sometimes you get uh, conditioned by unpleasant event or even traumatic event and 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 they stay there <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so and so you know people are not most people are not aware but you start developing some sort of like you know like some neurological knots or neurological triggers that that get reinforced in your life and it's very subliminal you know you get this first traumatic event And then you, you know, you put yourself in situation to relieve it again. And that Krishnamurti was talking about the constellation of the trauma. It's not just one, it's the predisposition. And then you end up finding yourself at age 30, 40, 50, and you realize that you lived all this life with some sort of a, an egoic armor mm -hmm. that has prevented to feel those knots. Yes. So to what extent going out and, and and some people get get you know really enslaved by the mind you know they say that the mind is a great master is a great servant but a terrible master <laughs> but so to what extent getting out of the mind into your heart and to your gut and maybe took a little bit of the science now about the heart and the gut to be able to give this intellect a break in a way mm -hmm. well as ne modern neuroscience has taught us that the heart has its own brain There's plenty, like thousands and thousands of like you know, neurons uh, connected to the heart that are connected to the brain. And also philosophers of mind has also made that connection, Damasio and many others, that the heart and the mind are like really interconnected and that many of the supposedly rational decisions that we think we take are also very influenced by our emotions. So in a way, like this new movement to us, a greater awareness and greater integration is also both making us more aware phenomenologically, experientially of all these connections, but also to give us like the, the tools to start like in the world, not only as like disembodied heads, but as whole human beings who also have different ways of knowing. And the knowledge of the heart is different than the knowledge of the mind, different than the knowledge of the body. So why don't we, 
you know, approach problems, both in our personal life, but also in a global scale, not only from this kind of rational mind, but with all those sorts of wisdom that we have, our instinctive world, our sexuality, and that life energy contains the, the wisdom of the instinctive life, that kind of wisdom that spawn um, the fauna and flora in all its diversity before the emergence of subconscious human beings, we can connect with that wisdom as well that has like the codes of life and apply it also to many of the problems. In many ways, like you can see this tendency already in like the disciplines of biomimetics today, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with it, like biomimetics is like a, it's like a new tendency in different kind of life sciences, but also in sciences and robotics and everything like to, to look at nature as a referent to solve problems problems that we haven't been able to solve. Nice. That was a little bit bug Mr. Fuller idea, right? <laughs> yeah, he was the origin of that. Yes. Studying mm. nature operating principle and try to copy them. Exactly. The problem when you live in, you know, contemporary societies, mostly in the West, but everywhere now, is that the tendency, you know, I grew up with my father saying that, you know, real men don't cry and, you know, never explain, never complain. This glorification of insensitive men really and 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 to a certain extent now there's been also passed to the woman because the women are in career but so how do you you know first question is do you think that you know this paradigm is changing and two we can start talking maybe of of community to what extent do you believe that implementation of a new paradigm where there is a more harmonious integration between the mind, the heart, and the gut is possible maybe through a like-minded group of individuals. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so two comments there. Like uh, The first one would be like uh, that shift of paradigm that we are speaking about, we need to also understand that it's a shift from a very patriarchal paradigm into a more egalitarian paradigm, and that needs to go through several ways of feminists to compensate these thousands of years, probably even more of a patriarchal culture around the world, even in indigenous culture. So this is important, like there was this philosopher called Susan Bordo wrote this book, The Flight from Objectivity, like a uh, unveiling, revealing like the patriarchal underpinnings of the car thinking, no? So this is one part, no? And then coming back to the second part about community, my sense that community is one of, is a cat growth catalyst. I've lived in community for 10 years in Berkeley, California. Now I'm here living in community. So conscious communities in which people are really trying to work together for different things, but also live together in conscious ways, you learn so much. I mean, you can have blind spots and your partner or your wife can point them to them and you are like, well, well, whatever. But when like one, two, three, four, five people in your community who live with you and know you well, mirror that blind spot, it's like that has like a force and you cannot like say, no, you are all wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, but so the, the precondition is that you develop a sense of trust and, and, and love among the community because then you don't feel to be exposed by exactly. a stranger. Absolutely. That's important. It's like respect, love, loving, mirroring. It's not, it's not ever like really like going after people. No, that would be like a nightmare. No. And the other part about the community, there are many dimensions. Uh, one is ecological, of course, it's much more sustainable. You, you spend less things, you share a washing machine, you know, like, you know, the whole nuclear family that is also coming together with capitalistic ethos and also patriarchal ethos, you know, the wife at home. <laughs> Man is working out there and also doing their own things, but also in the nuclear family situation, every single unit has the TV, has the washer machine, has, you know, it's like, and this, of course, has benefited tremendously the industries that are producing those products. If you look at this, like some studies, like in the States, looking at the industry of advertisement from the 1930s and 40s into the 80s. And you can see like the shift, you know, all this advertisement had like the, the mother, the, the father and the two kids and the house behind. It was like a powerful message, like going into the unconscious of people that that was the way to live. And it's not the way we have lived for 
millennia. <laughs> so no wonder people feel isolated and also no wonder people also have a lot of problems, like even, even when there is genuine love, like living together. And we can also raise questions, is this the best for children? Because children, when they're growing up, like to be in contact with many different adults and other children, they develop more emotional intelligence. They have to guess the mental states of more people. So they develop empathy, more emotional intelligence, they are more effective people later in the world. Yeah, this is so interesting. But so, again, can you put up your teacher's head for a second? So when did we start to live community, the tribal setting, and start going in individual housing. It started with the, probably with agriculture and private property. We start accumulating. It, when, when in the world we start? Well, I, th I think there were different waves, different stages of that. Definitely with the advent of agriculture and then settlements, there was a surplus of production. And then it's for first time, because before we were nomads, like many indigenous people today, and they were like hunters. And so for first time, like men started to realize, well, I have all these things now. I want to leave them with to my children, not to the neighbor's children. This Many feminist analyses and historical analyses point out that it's connected also with the rise of monogamy, as you know, and the control of women's sexuality to really make sure that the you properties know, get passed through my hair. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. this has been a very important economic, drive, political yeah. drive yeah. in all this, you know. But the shift, the real shift from the kind of more community living to the nuclear family happened in the 20th century, actually. People think that it was like far, far away. It was in the 20th century, like my mom, for example, in Spain, she grew up in a house with like 13 cousins, uncles and grandmothers. It was very normal, even in the States, like to have like this extended family situations, like, but that kind of like pressure to have your own and, and it was advertised as freedom and autonomy and there was something to it <laughs> but the toll was very has been very yeah. expensive yeah and also and also there was the pressure of competing with the neighbors this idea of like you know keeping with the jones the bigger car the bigger house i remember someone was telling me, me that his great grandmother was living in Brooklyn, and in the neighborhood, there was like you know every weekend the the neighborhood the barbecue, and everybody brought things, and and now they put fences and guard dogs and barbed wire, and 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 but so okay, this is I think it's it's important even if for example for me if you tell my wife about living in community, she would like you know divorce me immediately, because some people like her for example you know she would say that you know i need my privacy i resource myself in silence and solitude mm -hmm. so i mean that you know it it doesn't mean that in community you can't have you know the quiet place or the you know you can still find your space but it is a little bit of, of a different approach yes. but so just to give some practical uh, advice to our listener Imagine there are like a group of people that are listening to us, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, or maybe, okay, first question is, what is the right number to go and live in community? And then what would you advise people that are listening if they are thinking that, you know, first of all, sometimes it's not even like a desire, it's a necessity because they can't afford the rent anymore anywhere. Many people cannot buy a house nowadays. So... Some people say, okay, I have to share the rent with 10, 20, 30 people. What practical advice do you have? Would you recommend people to study all the existing community and maybe join one or, or maybe join one to learn and then start your own? Mm -hmm. You know, I had the Esperida, your friend Esperida that I met through you, the, mm -hmm. I call her the ambassador of Damanhur. She was saying that you need, in order to to live in community, you need to have an impossible dream. <laughs> but is that true? Can you comment on that? I love it. Let me just go back slightly. Because I understand and I resonate to a large extent with that like sense of many people, wow, I don't want to lose my privacy and my autonomy. I don't want to lose my privacy and my autonomy. And this is, I think, the difference between the new communities that are emerging now and the communities back in the 60s, the communes, the kibbutz, you know, where there was no space for individuality. That was a disaster. We are individual and social beings. It's very important that these communities like have a space for each person that is your kingdom, is your refuge, you have your room, or perhaps in the model of co-housing that uh, there are different family units or different groups and there is like, maybe common areas, common kitchens. So people have their own space to develop their individuality that is very important without 
the continuous pressure or, I don't know, influence of the community, and then share all that with the community. That's very important. But we have like so internalize also all those values, you know, of autonomy and privacy to, a, to an extreme way, you know, like why people need to be so private all the time, I wonder. And, and something interesting is something, <laughs> yes, we can raise those questions. And something interesting, of course, and there are studies of that is when nuclear family situation, that conditions of privacy is are the perfect conditions for abuse. Abuse of children, abuse of women, domestic violence. Of course, because when you are living with more people, it's much harder. People listen, uh, they stop it, you know. Those, those, those households like are the perfect conditions for the pandemic of domestic abuse that uh, we're witnessing these days, and also children abuse and other things. So, so there's also consequences there. So to go back to your second question, what to advise in possible dream? That's no, first of all, <clears throat> is that true? Because, you know, in your community, you don't have an impossible dream. I mean, you have this individual dream. Yeah, there is not an impossible dream, but there is like some kind of like shared values and even shared goals and could be very vague and expansive. Like in our communities, for example, it's a project here to us aim at healing, art, and education, and the interface. So people engage that project in different ways, and that's very enriching. And the sad thing or the tragedy of many spiritual communities is when they go into one single ideology. And that happens in many spiritual communities, even communities that are very healthy. And for some of them, it works very well. You have the Tinaroville, you have the Indamanhur, beautiful communities they are wholesome in many different ways and still there is a set of kind of doctrines dogmas that all of them who live there need to adopt to some extent in order to be accepted in the community i think that's valid for some people if they resonate with those values i think it's like why not find your own tribe but i think that the most kind of like meta modern communities that are emerging today are more pluralistic in their values they share certain kind of you know like you know basic orientations like respect, mindful speech, open to he to the other, no? But they don't, like in the community in Berkeley, we have like people who are into shamanism, we have Buddhist people, we have like more secular people in, in, into dance and, and everybody was welcome. And that's so interesting. You call them meta, meta community? Meta modern. Meta modern. Yes, we're going to talk more about that. What about the numbers? Is, is there a uh, recommended number that you would advise? I don't think so. I wouldn't go that far because there are different types of community. The communities I've been living most of my life, adult life, they were like small communities, like normally like eight, ten adults, some children and so forth. Uh, that community is to create a sense of intimacy, a sense of like um, being together that much larger communities don't. And at the same time, much larger communities, they, they have more resources and they can achieve greater things in terms of transforming the world or transforming uh, the area where they live. So I would say that is good, my sense, uh, in attunement with my pluralistic <laughs> spirit, it's good to have different kinds of communities, like more larger, more smaller. And then each person can see what's the pros and cons of each of them. The more people you have, the more complex and the more disagreements and the more difficulties are uh, coming together. <laughs> and that happened in Auroville. There was sort of disagreements. At first, they had like these policies about being taking decisions by consensus. And of course, anyone could veto <laughs> any decision. And of course, that was a disaster. They, they, they were paralyzed. They couldn't do anything. <laughs> yes. So I guess that there is, at the two opposite end, there is the Oroville, the, the Tamera, the Damanhur, where it's really the glue is this impossible dream where people need to vote and there's a consensus. And then at the completely other spectrum, there is just like sharing the rent in a group of people. And in between, all kind of possible. Have, have you heard this number, the Dunbar number? It's 140, 150? I heard Yes. Yeah. So first of all, let's explain what it is. Yes, you explain it because... But it's, it's simply there's been a statistic saying yeah. that 140 roughly is the right number for people to know everybody intimately. But because if it's more than that, you start losing the intimacy with people, but you still have some anonymity, you know, less than that. Yeah. Um, I, th I think there is something to it. I think this social reality that when there's more and more people, you'll get to know less people intimately. And, and that's, 
and it brings the sense of anonymity. I don't know, like my sense is that like, uh, even larger communities, they, they are playing a strong role because they are experimenting with different ways to, you know, political organization. I mean, they are grassroots experiments for the larger society and larger culture will have to pay attention to at some point as this way we live are kind of like being kind of deconstructed and like uh, is, is crumbling in many ways. So in a way they are like, uh, I would say that potentially it could be seen in the future as a vanguard, a vanguard for a new way of life that more and more people are going to be adopting. Yes, yes. I'd love the, our listeners to really realize that this idea of building community is not just this new age concept. I think it's the root of our alienation and depression. You know, I think his name is uh, John. John Harry wrote a book on depression. He spent 20 years researching it. And at the end, he came down to the, the main cause of depression being the lack of connection with others. You know, exactly. we are deeply social animal and... The neoliberal capitalism has, and 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 the and the supremacy of reason has created this, you know, hyper individualized unit in competition with other, and I think that has brought a lot of a lot of misery. In addition to that, you know, price around the world of housing has become crazy. So some young, you know, in Ibiza specifically, in Ibiza. Talking about the dream and the purpose of a community in Ibiza, we have Ibiza is 500 square kilometer, and only six percent of this land is farmed regeneratively. So, you know, one model that can, you know, that's why now we are in 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 July. It's like 40 degree. There is no water. You know, Ibiza needs to have used to have a lot of water. In the 40s and the 50s, you see this black and white video of like full on river from a sprawl. And then the the pines came, which are not indigenous from here, and took over most almost half of the island. And the pine, they don't allow anything to grow, and the and the pine needle is very acidic, and it doesn't absorb CO two, it doesn't absorb water. All the rain, which does rain here a few weeks a year, goes washed mostly washed up in the sea. If we regenerate, let's starting, but. 10, 20%, you know, 10,000 hectare of, of Ibiza, we could change the ecosystem. We could have a more temperate country. If we regenerate, you know, starting with, I don't know, 10,000 hectare, we can, we, can, we can absorb more CO2, we can absorb more water. You know, by farming regeneratively, we can create a more resilient ecosystem that resists more, you know, to, 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 the, to the external condition. And in order to do that, you know, these housing, these things are very expensive because the owners prefer just to rent it three months in the summer for much more than all year round rent. But if you put 15 people together, they can share that rent and they can regenerate the land. So this model is replicable. And, and Ibiza can be an example for the world in terms of like regenerating agriculture by, you know, uh, creating biodiversity and also feeding, feeding the microbiota and, and, and creating health. Maybe maybe Ibiza can become the new uh, you know blue zone with uh, a lot of hundred years old. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah, but so why I went in this rant about Ibiza? Yes, because I think that community it's can be a way to for people to to find purpose, to find connection, and 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 to be able to be exposed to this permanent sort of like friendly group therapy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Very good. So what did we write for the next topic? Yes, changing completely. I discovered this English podcaster called Chris Williamson and she and he interviewed these three woman writers and he says that those three ladies could maybe represent <clears throat> a new wave of of a feminist feminism, a UK new feminist movement and they are Louise Perry, Nina Power and Mary Harrington. So do you feel comfortable in maybe first trying to explain what they think. You know, Louise, they all came up with book about how the sexual revolution has failed everybody, yes. both men and women. Do you feel comfortable to first explain their theory 
and then maybe object mm-hmm. or comment. Mm-hmm. Sure. I'm, I'm familiar with Louis Perry. I don't know the other authors so well to make an informed opinion. But uh, Louis Perry, I'm familiar with the argument. It's, it's not a new argument in some ways, but I mean, the, the core argument is like the sexual revolution is benefiting men and hurting women. Because uh, women ultimately, deep down, what they, they don't want casual sex. They want like to have a partner for life. And they want to be traditionally married. She doesn't say that, but that's underlying her argument. She's pro-traditional marriage till death pull us apart. And uh, and then uh, it's kind of interesting because in a way I find it is like she makes other points that are uh, some of them are you know has some validity. Uh, you know, any anything in life, any path, any movement has uh, cast light and shadow. So the sexual revolution I think has been a tremendously liberating and empowering force for. Men, but especially I would say for women in so many different ways that they were like, before the sexual revolution, they were like at home, their sexual autonomy was close to zero. And now tremendous amounts of women in the West, you know, they have a sexual autonomy and freedom that they, it was would have been undreamed by our grandmothers. So that's something that is, is very important. But she's making really some good points in the sense that like, in the same way that for some women, this has been a very empowering force. She comments, for example, on young females, especially in college and even earlier in which, in the same way that before there was like some pressure, social pressure to not be promiscuous. If you were a woman and had sex with different guys, you were like a slut, you were like a whore and all, all that. Now there is some pressure and these ages to, to be sexually free. So, and then women that some of the perhaps younger women who are still not fully formed in their own empowerment, they could get lost there. And that's true. That's as he's making a good point there. But uh, we don't we don't need to throw the baby with the bath water, <laughs> right? We can identify some areas that are problematic in the sexual revolution, but that doesn't mean that the sexual revolution has failed women. There is like tremendous amounts of women, I would say most women in the West today, that they would defend the sexual revolution as an empowering force in their lives. In a way, also, the other points he's making is like that we have lost the connection that existed before between sex and commitment, love and commitment. And, but the connection that exists before between those two was because there was no the, um, anticonceptive pill. You know? So for women, for women like to be sexual was a very high risk of getting pregnant. Okay? So therefore, they were asking for a deep commitment for men before going sexual and uh, marriage and all that. So in a way, it's like she's twisting this, <laughs> she's twisting this, like saying like, and then we have lost this uh, connection between love and commitment. But well, for many women, that has been tremendously liberating, like to, to be able to take the pill and to take autonomy and be able to have sex with whoever they want without that danger, without that danger there. And, and of course, uh, you could say, as to say, like, well, men has benefited from that because there is more available women that they would like to have sex with them. That's true. There is also a book by a conservative sociologist of sex called Cheap Sex, Regnerus. Maybe you're familiar with it. He's making that case from very conservative places. He's saying, like, sex has become cheap. Before, sex was expensive, you know. Men who have to, you know, offer things, commitment and marriage. And, and now, you know, people can have sex whatever, you know, even with pornography, pornography is available, and then women are more open to that. And I don't see that as a negative necessarily, even though, again, there could be like some, in particular cases, that it could be like some problematic aspects to it. Why? What's the name of the author you just mentioned? R- R- Regnerus, R-E-G-N-E-R-U-S. Yeah, we'll put it on the show note. But why Why was the problem with the more affordable sex according to Regnerus? <laughs> Well, he's saying that sex has been banalized, yeah. that that now it's like available and therefore uh, people, men don't want to commit and they don't want to get married. Yeah. And he's pro-familiar values, pro-traditional uh, marriage. He's against, of course, gay marriage and, and all those things. Yeah. He's a very conservative fellow. But basically that's his point. It's like, because now sex, sex is so available, then men don't commit. And there is something to it. And I do have many female friends actually in the early 30s that actually they would want to have children and they would like to find a man uh, that is available for that. And it's true that those numbers are picking down, are decreasing, especially in places like this. I'm going to hate my friends. I tell I tell the same to them that I would tell my friends in the same situation in, in the Bay Area of California. Move out. <laughs> Because here in Ibiza, there is more women than men to begin with. And also, I would say there is a greater number of non-committal men, in part because of the larger number of women and there, there is more availability. But in other places, it's different, of course. Yeah, that's another big topic, right? So 
you know, what, what caught my attention from Louis Perry is that the more available sexuality has created also a lot of pain in the sense that men are not really fulfilled by casual sex. They think they are. It's one, it's one of the things like, it's a little bit like what, what I understood from, from the interview I heard. It's a little bit like, you know, neoliberal capitalism subliminally will make you think that you need to live in the house alone with better things than your neighbor. You know, that's an illusion because that doesn't bring happiness. In the same way, the sexual revolution will give you this illusion that sex, you know, a lot of sex with different people will give you happiness, but the reality is that it's not. Mm-hmm. You know, what brings you really fulfillment is a deeper, more committed relationship. And this idea of, of disentangling sex from love has brought misery, not just, you know, mm-hmm. she says that deep inside, you know, women are longing for connection, but also also men. Mm. And there is now an epidemic of men with erect, erectile dysfunction mm. being overstimulated by porn. Yes. So the statistic says that usually there's a, you know, there's a quite a widespread sexual dissatisfaction. Mm. So I know you wrote a book called, you know, Novogamy, where, where you try to depolarize the debate around monogamous and non-monogamous. But so can you try mm-hmm. to... Um, to tie all this thing up into a cohesive vision. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Okay, so I think there is something to that point. There is something to that point. But I would, and of course, I totally agree that the, the pull, the longing for deep, intimate connection is one of the is very valid and real. And to experience that is one of the most fulfilling experiences of life. I also agree that many men are having sex with many women, ultimately unconsciously looking for that, and they are not getting it. So I also agree with that. And at the same time, would qualify like, well... Because they're not embodying that desire, right? Because if, if it's only subconsciously that they're longing, but everything else says that they're not, it's not going to work. Yes. yes. Yeah. And But I would also add here something very important, is that many, even most men in this culture that we live precisely for the what we discussed before, that people live in their heads, they're not really connected to their heart and their instincts, you know. Their sexuality is very mechanical, it's disembodied, it's like a, they go geni- hypergenital, I'm just going to have my orgasm. And of course, many of these men have learned sexuality from pornography that is also very patriarchal. And, uh, and of course, that sexuality is yeah. going to leave them unfulfilled. Yeah. And the shame from the church. Yeah. Yeah. But if people engage sexuality, even sexual casual encounters, from a fully embodied perspective that is also open to that energy of life in yourself as eros, as the creative energy of life, as something sacred, and also like fully conscious and with their heart opens, I don't think they would be so unfulfilled. Yes. Yes. So let's talk about that a little bit. This idea of eros, you know, like genital orgasm, full body orgasm, how we misuse this sexual energy how we were not being educated. Like, you know, Margot Anand, this Tantra teacher, says that many spiritual traditions don't even look below their waist. Right. Because they say it's dangerous. Yes. They don't even look. And so how can you elaborate a little bit mm-hmm. on that? This, this, when you mentioned the genital yes. orgasm compared to a full body, and maybe since we are talking about that, we can, you can uh, talk a little bit about your conscious, your embodied spirituality workshop. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the reasons, like most traditions don't, even look from the waist down is like uh, it was considered dangerous uh, sexuality and there were some reasons for that historical there were some reasons there was a lot of bestialists there was a lot of rapes there was like people were not integrated enough to channel that energy constructively and especially in many cultures because, in the world you lose your mind you lose your mind last. yeah exactly the fear is that animalistic tendencies will take over and it will just become like a rapist animal and you know if you travel around the world, I know you have you are very well traveled, you realize that in some cultures in the world, that's still quite valid in many ways. Like and in India, in village, uh, rural India, for example, and, and there's a lot of sexual taboos and tension and, and so forth, you know, Muslim countries as well, some of them. So so that that's that. But I would say, like, I would argue that uh, most people in the Western world today, they have already developed values of the heart, our consciousness, strong enough to be able to channel those energies in a different way. So I think that's why I'm advocating for, you know, full chakra, spiritual life that invites all of who we are into uh, into spirituality and in our lives, including our sexuality, our instinct and so forth. So uh, coming back to, to your question is like, uh, you know, there is like different types of sexuality. 
in the same way that there is different types of spirituality. This spirituality that is very disembodied, spirituality that is more integrative. And sexuality, there is like sexuality that is like mechanical, hypergenitalized, like dissociated from their heart and the consciousness. Like, and that kind of sexuality, of course, is going to leave people quite unfulfilled. But also it's a kind of sexuality that is going to be very hard to integrate with a spiritual sense. So when, when, when you make love and you're not present and it's very, how, what do you mean mechanical? <laughs> well, the kind of sexuality you see in porn and that's the sexuality that many, 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 you know, we, we, we are witnessing what has been called the pornification of society. Billions, billions of, you know, that Pornhub has statistics. It's quite remarkable what you see there. Like every single day, there's 100 to 115 million hits in one page of porn, Pornhub, you know. That's the equivalent of like the populations of like four different countries in the world, like hitting at the same time. And, uh, and women too. Yes, and women too, not only not only men, this are thirty two percent of women are also watching porn. So they're also learning of course there's different types of porn. There's porn that also could be non patriarchal and uh, directed and produced by women with attention to female organs in a different story. And I would say that I support that kind of thing. Could be educational, could be liberating for many women. But ninety nine percent of porn is super patriarchal. It ends with male orgasm. And if you see it's degrading like, it's degrading, it's like boom, 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 harder and stronger. Harder, harder and stronger, I mean, it could have like a place in, in, in our sexual encounters at some times, the passion, the animalistic, sure, but also sexuality needs to move to more also like subtle, tender, connected, uh, presence, uh, eye gazing, uh, with your heart opening and so forth. And that's a different kind of sexuality that opens up into Eros as mystery. And that's the kind of sexuality that is almost inevitable not to be able to integrate with our spiritual sense, the mystica. Mystica and Eros is two sides of the same mystery. Amazing. But so, so can, can you talk a little bit about what did you, you created a workshop, you call it Embodied Spirituality, where, where people touch each other on this, on this fully closed, there's nudity, in, but people touch each other on this vital part of the navel, the heart, the chest, the forehead, and in a way, transfer given, there's a transfer of energy, which I experienced, which I think it was like, for me, life-changing, but can you describe that a little mm -hmm. bit? Well, it's a word that is about precisely integrating all those senses. It's a work about opening our body and our heart and our mind to both energies, the energy of our consciousness and that life energy. And, and for all those worlds to start becoming like active players in our life, in our sexual lives, then to be energized and enlightened, illuminated. Because it gives an energy to move and direction and discernment. So that's kind of like one of the overall goals of the work or aims. But each particular person, as you know, find their own ways. People come from sexual healing or sometimes like they come because uh, a couple that they are like working on the relationship. Each person find their own because it's, this is what I love about that work. Is It's a word that, you know, the... The, the pathways start emerging from your own experience. You have an experience and that kind of leads you to shape through contracts uh, the next experience. And we saw a limited version of that in our workshop, but that's where the strength of the work is. So, uh, and it's a work also about integrating, like differentiating and integrating, for example, the heart and, uh, and the vital center, our sexuality. Because, uh, you know, in, in more men than women, those centers are dissociated. That's why so many men can fuck and don't care. But in many women uh, have the opposite problem. Is those centers are fused, they are they are merged, so they make love and they fall in love. The heart and sexuality, they are fused, but they are merged, uh, so they they make love. And if the good was the sex was good, just one day they are falling in love with this person. That's also a problem. I would say that in the same way, life teaches us, you know, water. Water is two different atoms. <laughs> oxygen and hydrogen who are connected but are fully differentiated and from that we have this magic that we call water emerging into reality so those worlds need to be differentiated and then integrated so people can really be sexual can be uh, emotional all the spectrum in between without falling into dis dissociation or fusion that leads to attachment that is premature in most cases yeah very well explained this is very good the metaphor of the water so to, just to continue on the on the controversial topic, like we did, I think it was it's useful for you know for this conversation to be a little memorable. You know, when 
to, to, to try to break down the cliche a little bit. For example, you know, community don't have privacy is not true. Sexual relation I, I brought cheap sex with casual sex is not true. You can have meaningful casual sex, as we discussed. So w- w- another um, debate is this idea of the universal truth, right, compared to a, a, a more plurality of, of truth. So um, you told me once that, you know, the, um, the universality comes more, f- you know, from the perennial philosophy, people like uh, Aldous Huxley and Ken Wilber and, and Joseph Campbell were talking about the, the unity, and, and then others were talking more about a plurality of truth. Can you, can you comment a little bit on that? Yes, 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 yes. In a way, like most of the attempts at trying to find a core, a universal experience, a universal liberation, or universal ultimate in religious truth come from two different places. On the one hand, it comes from a place of like a ecumenism. You know, there's so much violence, religious violence in the world. So many people were motivated. Well, if we really find some common truths, I think there could be one less reasons for violence. You know, it's much easier to kill your neighbor when you think God is on your side and not on their side, right? So, and that's a very novel ideal. But the problem with that, and this connects with the second intention that is normally more unconscious in many cases, is apologetics. It's like to... It's like apologetics is in religious is when you when you are trying to argue for the superior truth of your own religion. When you see all the proposals for universal truth, and uh, you see what they are saying, for example, non-duality, it's a very fashionable these days, or pure consciousness, and so forth. And you start the history of religious traditions and comparative mysticism. You realize that that's the goal and aim for a few traditions, but not all. We have over probably fifteen thousand different religions in the world many of which have very different cosmologies and different goals. So 15,000. Yeah, well, 20, 20 years ago, they were identified 9,800 and two or three new religions emerging every single day. So today... I but think, when people set up their own church, that's... Uh, how do you determine a religion? To be uh, well, that's this, there are criteria. There are criteria like this is used, this was a study by some religious religious scholars and uh, Christian religious scholars. They were, they were mapping what they call theodiversity. They were mapping the spiritual pluralists because they wanted to convert everybody <laughs> into their own religion. So they wanted to see which, where, who, are the, who are the rivals there, no? But the problem with that is like, you know, all this, exactly, you know, when you identify that truth, <clears throat> it is the truth of some traditions and not others. So in a way, it's another, it's a hidden form of exclusivism or inclusivism uh, that is also reveals a kind of like subtle spiritual narcissism like my spiritual truth, it's my spiritual mind. choice is the superior or the more truth or the more complete or the more encompassing. And you don't have to be a narcissist for that. Take the Dalai Lama, for example. The Dalai Lama that I very, very much admire, probably one of the less narcissistic persons in the world, <laughs> personally speaking. And I know people who know, they, who know him and I, he's the real article in so many ways. But he defends that the spiritual truth, the understanding of sunyata, of emptiness of his own particular school in Tibetan Buddhism, is is something that even the other Tibetan schools don't understand, not to speak about other Buddhist branches or other religions. And he deeply believed that uh, even though having a diversity of religious choices today is a good thing for psychological reasons, down the line, after many lifetimes, everybody will recognize that truth as the most liberating of all. Which is which is which one in the case of the Dalai Lama? In the case of the Lama, it's an understanding of emptiness, emptiness of emptiness, like more. That's, that's we'll get more technical here, but that's in the matter. It's like that space between thoughts. Yeah, <clears throat> a kind of emptiness. Emptiness understood as in, in Buddhist emptiness is the codependent arising of everything. No, no, nothing has its own essence, but everything is being co-created by everything else, and that's a beautiful understanding. But other traditions have different goals. So I'm a spiritual pragmatist. I go for whatever works. What is helping people to become less self-centered, less selfish, more available, more transformative agents in the world? Is it conscious parenting? Is it Buddhist meditation? Is it ayahuasca shamanism? I don't care. (laughs) What matters is that they're really like getting more free from narcissism, selfishness, and more open to the mystery, you know, of existence, you know. So, and then also, I'm a spiritual pluralist. I believe, frankly believe, strongly believe after 
through my own experience, I was in Buddhist for 15 years, in shamanism for another 20 years. I've studied many different traditions and I, I'm having many dialogues, you know, with monks from different traditions. I strongly believe that there is a beauty and richness in that diversity of spiritual goals that all the traditions and different people and different mystics are, are telling us, you know, there is all these different possibilities. It's like a tree branching in different directions. And some of the branches overlap. So there are, there are some commonalities, but that doesn't mean that they are going, all going to the same peak of the mountain. I would say that there are many mountains and many peaks. Amazing. Beautifully said. Just for our listen, you mentioned that non-duality now is fashionable and divine consciousness. Pure consciousness. Pure consciousness. Can you explain a little bit these two approach? Yeah, well, a non-duality comes, I mean, non-duality comes from, normally the kind of non-duality that does uh, become fashionable in the West comes from India. It's, uh, Mana Maharshi and also a lot of uh, different gurus there and uh, and many like uh, there is a lot of non-dual teachers in the West today like from Gangaji to Ajisanti to to many many people who have like drink from that wisdom tradition and they have adapted to our modern West and I think it's a great thing I, 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 I'm very supportive of whatever works you know but for not people. exclusively yeah but just to make the claim that that's kind of like the universal thing for all human beings and I'm not saying that the, you know we all have consciousness so can we all access pure consciousness sure very likely we can all because it's an area that we all share like we have a body we have a heart and so forth but do all the traditions value pure consciousness the same way no for them for some of them is the goal and it's the most liberating experience for all of them it's just a step for example in the mystical christian traditions pure consciousness encounter with your personal soul it's a preparation for encounter with a personal god that loves you right and other traditions don't care about pure consciousness and they have different businesses to do you know different paths that they're offering us mm, beautiful just to change uh, topic again you know I've, I've, a dear friend of mine his name is anton bilton he started an institute called the tiringham institute and it's a think tank to research to research the nature of the entity that you see, you encounter in the psychedelic experience, mm -hmm. mostly DMT. He's persuaded that these entities, not only they're not project of your imagination, not only they are independent from us, but they're also sentient. They are independent sentient being that you, another word for that is alien or spirit or ghost or and and he thinks that maybe they have a superior knowledge than us mm -hmm. and maybe they can help us with the human affair mm -hmm. you know like in that movie arrival but then it's villeneuve you know this big octopus looking alien yes. then prevented the world war i know you wrote some paper about that mm -hmm. about this you know, again, this this different opinion on on people saying are there are there our product of our imagination or they're really people that they are okay. in can might be interdimensional. What's yes. what's your take on yes. that? Yes, yeah, I have two 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 comments here. One of the nature of the entities, and the second one about how to how to really better try to find out if they are autonomous. <laughs> So the first, the first part is like, you know, there are different postures and you already talk about them. There's one posture, more materialistic science. It's like, well, this is just like figures in your dream, you know. Sometimes you have encounters with figures in your dream that are very wise and they talk to you and they look like autonomous, but very likely are just a part of your unconscious, right? <laughs> and that's a strong argument because uh, it's a strong argument because most people you know, who have not experienced encounters with <laughs> entities in psychedelic or other Technology of consciousness, they will say, of course, that's what it is, what they're talking about. And then on the other hand, you have, like, of course, the more uh, indigenous and also more uh, new age and also uh, transpersonal understandings, like, well, they're independent entities. We live in a multidimensional world and, and these entities live there and they can also come and help us to heal us. And um, almost everybody I know who have gone deeper into uh, any kind of teacher plan, whether this is mushrooms or ayahuasca or San Pedro, sooner or later have some encounter with some of these entities that is very, very strong. And of course, in between, like, there's also this sense, like, well, to what extent is this like a false dichotomy? Like, are they purely subjective or are purely objective? Maybe they're in between. 
And in between, maybe they are subjective, objective. They are somehow co-created to some extent. Like, And this, I think there is some truth to that in the sense that it's very likely that some of the beings of light, he, the astral doctors that some people see in ayahuasca ceremonies, healing people, a Christian person would see this being of light and will say, oh, I saw an angel. There's an interpretive, cultural interpretation of imperception, embedded imperfection. So there's something to there that is true. And at the same time, there is other occasions in which you know, I had an encounter with like what it looked like. Their Taoist teacher, like bringing from his pocket, like gifts from his little bag. And every gift was like a Shakti energetic transmission. So you're feeling your whole body or you experience like very strongly this astral doctors healing your heart and doing like an energetic laser like surgery on your heart center and or, or your vital center no so these are very strong experiences but at the same time insofar as we're studying this for example like your friend like dmt people people doing individual journeys or even with their eyes closed by themselves the critique of western science is going to stand the the, the way out of this is and this is what i was trying to do in that article uh, it's like to say, well, based on my own experiences with San Pedro and Ayahuasca, it's like, well, some, sometimes people, and it's, it's rare, but it happens, sometimes people, different people can see the same entities with their eyes open. That has happened to them a number of times. And that's a stronger challenge for scientific materialism. It's very, yes. it's very easy to dismiss, like something that happens when you take a drug, quotation marks, in your brain. It's like, of course, an hallucination enhanced by the drug and so forth. But when different people, even sometimes for 15 minutes, one hour, even two hours, are seeing the same entities outside and they're contrasting and interacting with them, that's a much harder. I and mean, you can go to this explanation, quotation marks, of a collective hallucination. But collective hallucinations, I study them in depth and they are a different type. It's, it's, they don't explain our theories of collective hallucination, like people see a UFO, or the Virgin in the sky, or tears in the Virgin. They're expecting to see something. There's a lot of like, or, and this is very different. It's a different and also has an impact in people who experience them. Again, ultimately, I'll just the last thing I say, I, I would go back to my spiritual pragmatism. It's an interesting discussion. I'm very interested in it, but. But who cares, you know, the most important is the transformation that they bring. If it brings people healing and, and transformation, that's great. And of course, some of people like us who are interested in more, is like, are they real? And that's fascinating inquiry, right? Yeah. I mean, Anton says we should care because we spend billion, trillion, NASA spend how much to send rocket and to put speakers that cost billions where there's not even funding for, you know, more exploration of these DMT states. Mm -hmm. So if, if our society care about the others because we're trying to connect and we spend so much. So he says, you know, if we just could allocate 1% of the budget that we spend and NASA spends to connect with these entities. But so... I just gonna, I, yeah. I tend to agree with your friend. Uh, so I'm retracting here a little because there is, two, there is the dimension of psychedelics or these plants so that is the healing dimension. From that perspective, I don't care. But from the perspective of the cognitive inquiry into exactly. reality, exactly. from that, it's very important. Exactly. So I agree with him. Exactly, exactly. That's a difficult question. But so you said that, you know, from what you said about, you know, when people can see the same entities for a couple of hours, can where do they come from? Can you explain? Do you have a theory of of this interdimensional, maybe parallel universe where people travel do you have a theory of, of time and space where mm -hmm. this makes sense? I don't want, I don't have a very well formed theory. I have been kind of like, kind of like an intrigue, you know, by different developments in modern science, both in neuroscience and quantum physics, you know. String theory tells us that there is like, you know, 9, 15, 21 different dimensions of reality. Otherwise, the, the numbers don't fit. And neuroscience, like in the last years, also like in nature, there were some articles saying the brain, the human brain is actually made to experience not just three, four dimensions, but seven. <laughs> that's from neuroscience, right? Are we, are we, are we going to witness, that's like a big question, speculative, are we going to witness at some point a convergence of all these developments and what people are experimenting in these inquiries, you know, in contact with this my sense, me from my personal experience, whenever whenever I've had like an encounter with these entities, is that the material would materialize in the front of my eyes from 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 empty space, and sometimes like it's a, it's a way in which like 
some of the plants, San Pedro, for example, teaches you to unfocus your eye to, to pay attention to to the to the spaces in between objects. And it's there where sometimes things starting to open, like even energetic networks, energy fields, you know, the energetic dimension of reality. That suggests experientially, without going into critical <laughs> analysis, that the life experience is that there's something interdimensional that we may live in, in this multidimensional cosmos and that this reality that we see and experience every day is the reality that the human brain thinks our evolutionary history has allowed us to see because it's what we need to survive in this embodiment. But that doesn't mean that there may not be other dimensions. And the difference would be that in these dimensions we are made of like energy consciousness and matter. My sense of other, these other dimensions is that it's more energy and consciousness. Uh, it's not the, the matter, the embodiment that we have here. And I think that's why this life here is so precious and important because that's, um, I would say that the greatest experiment is happening here in that integration of energy and consciousness and matter. Amazing, amazing. So we're a little bit past the hour, but our Lisa will forgive me because this is fascinating. I just have the last question for, you know, in Ibiza especially, but around the world, there's a big fashion now of the, um, you know, the retreat, the retreat center, the retreat experience. You know, people say, I don't I'm a retreat, retreat junkie. What do you, what, what's your idea on this, you know, this idea of the retreat to go somewhere else for one week, 10 days? four days with a group of people doing a certain practice. And uh, and then I know you collaborated with Ezalen. And uh, yeah, let's start with that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a very important thing because when people are in our culture and everyday life are so busy, like normally, and also thinking about all problems to solve and engaging in making a life. And it's hard to really go, go deeper into ourselves. And it's hard to, to really kind of examine ourselves and to, to really even connect with our deepest motivations and longings, you know. So I would say like those retreats are like a greenhouses, you know, like a greenhouses in, you know, like sometimes we... We protect certain plants who are like really like tender, tender uh, in a greenhouse, and later we replant it in the external world. So in the same way, like those are these like greenhouses for our, our inner tender growing seeds and, and and blooming inside, no, and and then. Once they get stronger and stronger, then we can start kind of materializing them in life and extending them in life. Beautiful metaphor. The, the, the retreat big and greenhouse for psychic insight. Yes. That need to be preserved in that safe environment that then can blossom and be nurtured outside. Exactly. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, and how was your Ezalen experience? How was Ezalen so successful compared to others? Well, I had a long history with Esalen, but I would say that I was so successful to begin with because it was the first, it was the first re center, retreat center. It was in 1962 that I was created by Mike Murphy and Dick Price. And it was very successful also because it encountered very quickly the whole climate of the counterculture, the whole experimentation. And also it brought amazing individuals, Altus Huxley, Gregory Bateson, oh, Fritz yes. Perls, Stan Grove, many of the innovative wars that we have like now with us, they were born in Esalen, like Fritz Pels developed deeper his Gestalt approach, uh, Stan Grof and Christina developed orthopic breathwork, and so many other developments. So in a way, it was like this mix of being in the right time, in the right moment, California in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, and also, I think it was like, you know, it's, it's still going, ongoing and it's a complete experimentation of our community life. It's a community life, and it's also a place in which, as I was referring before, there is no single ideology. And this is something that both Mike Murphy and Dick Price were very strong because they both have had contact with gurus and teachers that they value. Mike Murphy is studying the ashrams with Sarah Bindu and so forth. But they were very clear, we don't want any leader here to become like the boss. You know, no Fritz Perls, no Stan Grof, no one. So therefore, they were always like having very different leaders, conferences, dialogues, like, and I think that's what, what we need and we still need. And I'm excited to uh, to hear that you are planning something here in Ibiza in that regard. Yeah, it's a bit early stage, but yes, because I, you know, what you said about California in the '60s, that environment and energy of everything is possible, of breaking of the old rules in in that chaos, new idea can emerge. And Ibiza is becoming, I think, the transformative capital of the world because the local and my friend Christian, who has been on the podcast, explained that very well. He says that. What has created the magic of Ibiza is the local, the payes, being in the having the mentality of live and let live. So they, you know, 
we are here, I have my land, you're there, you have your land, you do what you want, you don't bother me, I don't bother you. This live and let live mentality has allowed for the for the freaks to come and the hippie to come and now the psychology professor like you to come and the tantra teacher and the classic tantra teacher and the five rhythm teacher and the breathing teacher and the embodied spirituality teachers. And there is so many, ta- so much talent here. So my last tricky question is, if you had to help the programming of a retreat in Ibiza, where would you go? What kind of discipline would you focus on, at least at the beginning? Well, I think that I wouldn't go into like super focus. I would go like more a wide, wider zoom because, like yeah, or like SLM, because you want to reach a different people and there are different ways to transform ourselves and different people are going to resonate with different things. So from the more embodied approaches to more contemplative approaches, I think the key thing we would like to really bring like really good people here into the island that, that sometimes are not available here. Uh, I think from outside, yeah. from outside and at the same time also pay attention to what's happening here in the island because there could be very amazing people here in the island as well. Yeah. So have some balance, no? have some balance between that, but definitely bring people from outside to that could be very enriching and even like have like not only just workshop, but like uh, like selling used to do like conferences, you know, and dialogues and panels and yeah. and that could be really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, debate, like really exciting to have. We don't have that in Ibiza. Yeah. We have a lot of static dances and tantra workshops and all of that is wonderful, but we don't have that kind of more intellectual, spiritual yeah. culture. And uh, I think there is a critical mass very ready for that, especially like if you're doing this in Dal de Villa. So many foreign people who come here are very sophisticated as well and they're into these things. So I think it would be a great, great success and very... Very good for the island. Amazing, amazing. So basically the three pillar, if you want, would be embodiment practices, contemplative practices, and then intellectual practices. Yeah, in- yeah intellectual debate, intellectual yeah. events, you know. And of course, at the same time of the embodiment and the, and the contemplative, it's also very important, like yeah. deep personal psychological work, like shadow work, like even trauma work, you know, because if you do all these other things, I mean, the embodiment piece includes a lot of that. But if you do a lot of the contemplative, for example, and without that deeper layer, the chances for spiritual bypassing are greater, spiritual materialism. If the audience doesn't understand it, spiritual bypassing is like to is to go into spirituality to avoid psychological issues. For example, I become celibate in order to avoid that I'm sexually repressed or have sexual trauma. For example, so there are greater chances of that, and we have seen this in California, even in the spiritual teachers as well, and very advanced practitioners. They were very advanced in their contemplation, meditation teachers, inter shamans as well. So we have seen that also in California for many years, in very advanced practitioners, meditation teachers, even shamans, of course, you know, that they could be very evolved in their realms, psychic healing or contemplative awareness, but later interpersonally, sexual, emotionally, they were underdeveloped, sometimes they have trauma, and it caused a lot of problems like sexual harassment and abuse. But so the shadow work, that's part of contemplation or embodiment? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would say like could be like different workshops on different areas, you know, but but I would say that somehow if it's like a pro and that people are going to be taking different modules or different things, there should be an element of that looking at, you know, at the trauma, the wounding, and because otherwise the foundation of the building is shaky. Of course, <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. Very well said. Jorge, we did one hour and 20. Thank you so much for coming back. I recommend our listen also, if they like this episode, to go back to the first episode where we talk more about Jorge's book, Novogamy, and and I just re-listen it and we cover the the future, the impact of Trump. So go back to the first episode also. Is there anything you want to add to want to you want to leave our listener with? No, yes, just gratitude for the opportunity to dialogue with you and like hopefully whatever anything something of what we have said is valuable for the audience and and, and it's great to hear from them. And if people want to come to one of your workshops, where do they find the info? On jorgeferrer.com? Yeah, it's Jorge N, uh, like Nancy, Jorge N. Ferrer.com. Yeah, I will be advertising that. Perfect. We'll put it on the show note. Thank you very much. Peace. <laughs> Coca, sonara, sonara, yenti. 
Coca-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-Sunarai-